This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. So let's settle back comfortably and listen, and uh, while you're getting settled, I'd like to know if you like seafood. And by seafood, I mean everything from, well, from broiled lobster to fried halibut. Because if you like seafood, any seafood, you'll love it together with Petri California Sautern. Fish and Petri Sautern were made for each other. No kidding. Boy, I'll never in my life forget a broiled brook trout on the plate in front of me and a glass of well-chilled Petri Sautern right next to it. Mm. That fish and that Sautern. Mm. Petri Sautern has a pale golden color that's really good to look at. And as for taste, well, that Petri flavor is really something. Take my word for it and try it, won't you? Oh, and I'll tell you something else. Try that Petri Sautern with chicken sometime. <laughs> Look, I better stop before I get hungry all over again, but just remember this. The best friend a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri wine. And now let's keep our appointment with the good Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Uh, come over here and, and join me by the fire. I didn't think it was cold enough for a fire tonight, Doctor. Oh, I suppose it isn't really, but there was one late, so I just couldn't resist putting a match to it. <laughs> Fire's a good accompaniment to storytelling anyway. Uh, yes, my boy, a fire and a glass of port. Uh, care to join me in one? Thanks, Doctor. So, uh, you're going to tell us a sea story tonight. Yes, Mr. Bartell. The whole adventure took place aboard a small steamer as it plowed through the stormy seas of the Indian Ocean. Uh, here's your glass, my boy. Thanks. And uh, what were you and the great Sherlock Holmes doing on the Indian Ocean, may we I ask? We were on our way to Calcutta to solve the case of the vanishing elephant of Pa Butipur. Oh, yes, the story you told us a few weeks ago. That's quite right, my boy. It's in the summer of 1894 that we left Liverpool aboard the steamship Lucifer wasn't a large ship, and as both the uh, Mediterranean and the Red Sea proved somewhat, shall we say, unfriendly, I may tell you the first part of the voyage was quite unpleasant. In fact, until we left Aden, I'd spent most of the time in my cabin. I'm not much of a sailor, you know. However, as we headed eastward towards Colombo, the weather cleared up a bit, and I came on desk and joined home. I remember on the second night out of Aden, we paced the decks together. The stars above us twinkled, the promise of a bright tomorrow and the faint tinkle of a piano being played in the passenger lounge formed a perfect setting for an evening stroll. It only seems like yesterday that Holmes said... Watson, it's good to see you on your feet again. Yes, it's good to be on them, Holmes. It's been a miserable trip for me so far. The captain told me tonight that we can expect good weather between here and Caravati, our next port of call. I thought Colombo was the next stop. And where is Kavaravati, whatever you call it? Anyway, I never heard of the place. It's a tiny island in the Indian Ocean. It's a British protectorate. Those are the only facts I was able to glean from the encyclopedia and the ship's Did library. Did you ask the captain why we're stopping there? No, no, I didn't. Um, we're traveling incognito. I felt it wiser not to ask too many questions. I find this incognito business something of a strain. Every time a steward calls me Mr. Hamish, I can't think who on earth he's talking about. <laughs> ah, well, as I find myself answering to Mr. Mycroft almost automatically. By the way, old chap... Now that you're going to mix with the ship's passengers, I suggest that you adopt a Scotch accent. It would seem more appropriate for Mr. Hamish, and I don't want anyone aboard to suspect our true identity. Oh, I'll do my best, but I must say, Holmes, I think you're being unnecessarily mysterious. <laughs> Possibly I've been influenced by reading too many of your rather florid stories of our adventures together. My stories are not florid. They're all perfectly true. Oh, don't, don't be angry with me, old chap. Don't be angry, please. By the way, uh, we'll... Uh, you'll be interested to know that I've... Uh, unearthed a little mystery aboard this well, boat. I trust you to do that. Where is she? I mean, what, what? is... Oh, you observe that suite of cabins on the bridge deck above us? Yeah? What about them? Well, I've been watching them during uh, my nightly strolls for the past two weeks. The suite is occupied and uh, the blinds are never raised. And I've never seen meals taken in there. I presume, therefore, that it must contain a private galley and a cook. I don't say anything mysterious about that. It's probably occupied by some wealthy invalid. Well, possibly, possibly. Another interesting fact is that the occupants are not uh, 
entered on the ship's passenger list. It all sounds very mysterious. There's probably a perfectly simple explanation for it. In any case, you must save your energies for the problem that awaits us in India. You're Mr. Mycroft now, remember that. I will, Mr. Hamish. Uh, Mr. Mycroft? Uh, yes, Mr. Hamish? Would you care to join me for a wee drop of brandy in the smoking room? <laughs> Mr. Hamish, I shall be delighted. <laughs> Excellent brandy. Excellent. Watson. Watson, you notice that rather garrulous gentleman over there in the corner? You mean the one at the table with the oriental-looking fella? Yes, the talkative man is the ship's doctor, but I haven't seen the other gentleman before on this voyage. I wonder if he's an occupant of the mysterious suite on the bridge deck. Let's go over and talk to him, shall we? And remember the accent, Mr. Hamish. <laughs> and so, Verda, when we landed at Colombo, I decided... Take Mrs. Abbott for a moonlight rickshaw drive for the cinnamon gardens. Uh, uh, did you gentlemen want to see me? Uh, if you'll excuse us, Dr. Harris, my friend Mr. Hamish and I were having a little argument and we thought that perhaps you might be able to settle it for An us. An argument? Oh, I love a good argument. Uh, sit down, gentlemen. This uh, this is Mr. Verder. How do you do, gentlemen? Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Hamish and this is my friend, Mr. Mr. Mycroft. I'm so happy to meet you, gentlemen. Now, how do you know, Mr. Verder? Ah, uh, now, gentlemen, uh, tell me what you're arguing about. Well, well Doctor, a good argument. Uh, you see, it, it wasn't exactly an argument. My friend Mr. Hamish insists that the Suez Canal was built by a Dutchman in 1870. I'm convinced that it was built by Lessips, a Frenchman, in 1869. We, uh, we thought you'd know. <laughs> you flatter me. I'm only a ship's doctor, not an historian. Ask Verdi. He probably knows. Uh, can you settle the question for us, sir? I can, Mr. Mycroft. Uh, you are almost correct. The canal was opened in 1869 though its construction began ten years previously. De Lesseps, a French engineer, was in charge of the operation. There is a statue of him in Port Said Harbor, built to commemorate his skill and enterprise. Oh, much obliged to you, Mr. Vera. Uh, Hamish, I think that I win my bet. I, my cuff, I'm afraid you do, if you're sure of your facts, Mr. Vera. <laughs> uh, I'm sufficiently sure of them, Mr. Hamish to venture a small wager myself. No, no, no. I think I'll not make any more bets on the subject, thank you. Uh, well, gentlemen, if you will excuse me, I shall return to my cabin now. Oh, don't go. No, 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 no don't go, sir. You'll make us feel as if we'd driven you away. Oh, not at all, Mr. Hamish. I enjoyed meeting you both, but I have some letters to write. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, he's, he's a charming person. Charming and extremely knowledgeable. Mm, bit of a bow, if you ask me. Uh, you two fellas enjoyed your trip? I'm just beginning to. It takes a little time to get my sea legs, you know. Uh, Dr. Harris, how long have you been on this ship? Four years. Uh, this is my third trip east on the Lucifer. Uh -huh. Why? Well, uh, there's something that puzzles me on board this ship. I'm sure that you would explain it to me. And what is it? Well, the uh, suite of cabins on the bridge deck. Who occupies them? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? I don't know we would, and that's why my friend asked you. Well, I'll tell you. Though it's supposed to be a secret. But there'll be no harm in telling you now, for we're dropping anchor off the island of Cavarati in the morning. In that suite of rooms, in that suite of rooms, is the Rani of Cavarati herself. She has her own staff of servants and everything. What do you think of that? Oh, how very interesting. And is the Oriental gentleman who uh, left the table when we arrived part of our entourage? He is, sir. He's the sort of uh, prime minister of Cavarati. This whole protest is very hush-hush. Rani returning to her country, afraid someone might make an attack on her life. Have to keep it all hush hush. Cavarati is an island that's had a lot of trouble. <laughs> you seem to be remarkably well informed about the place, sir. Yeah, I should be. I used to practice there in my younger days. Oh, really? How oh, very interesting. Yes, I could tell you strange tales about the island. I remember. Oh, hello. See that fellow coming into the lounge? You mean the big man with the, the grey hair? Yes. That's Sir Christopher Wyatt. Owns all the tea plantations on Cavarati. He's a dull fella, but I'll call him over. Uh, Wyatt, come over and join us. Be careful. You talk your head off if you give him half a chance. Ah, draw up a chair, Wyatt. We were just just talking about Cavarati. It seems to me that would be a good subject to keep away from. At least till after tomorrow, Harris. What do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. I should have thought that after your own experience on Cavarati, you'd have learned a little discretion. You're talking like a schoolmaster, Wyatt. Why don't you sit down and have a drink and be friendly? Thank you. I prefer my own company. Pompous ass. <laughs> you and Sir Christopher don't seem on the best of terms, Doctor. I know too much about him. He's afraid of me. That's what he is. Uh, look at this girl coming into the room. Great scut. She's good looking. 
Judging by our oriental costume, she must be a member of the Rani's retinue. <laughs> She's coming to our table. Yes, my dear, what is it? Which of you gentlemen is Mr. Mycroft, please? I am. My mistress sends her compliments and asks that you will call on her in her suite. And who is your mistress, may I ask? Her Highness, the Rani of Cavarotti. Oh, I shall be delighted. Please tell the Rani that I shall pay my respects without delay. We will join her in a few minutes. Very well, Mr. Michael. You know, Holmes, this is pretty exciting. The girl that just brought us the message was a stunning creature. Imagine what the Rani herself must be like. Oh, what an incurable romanticist you are, Watson. I suppose you picture the Rani clad in oriental splendor, reclining like an odorless con- silken cushion. No, 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 there's no need to make fun of me, old fellow. <laughs> oh, here we are, the cabin. Ah, oh, it is you, gentlemen. Follow me, please. Her Highness, the Rani of Cavaratti. All right, Regina, you can off it. Yes, Your Highness. Well, me lads, don't look so startled. Come in and sit down. Your Highness, I... Uh, uh... What's the matter? What's the matter? Don't I fit into your picture of a Rani? What did you expect? A slant-eyed beauty with a veil and big hips? Well, I've got the big hips, all right. Uh, your Highness... Um, <laughs> oh, you... never mind, Your Highness. Sit yourselves down and talk free and easy-like. I may as well begin by telling you that I know who you both are. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, dear me, dear me. Oh, I've seen you in the good old days in London, you know. Uh, may I ask if our visit is purely a social one, or are you in need of uh, professional advice? No, oh, a little of both, Mr. Holmes, a little of both. And we'll start off with being social. Bruma. Mem Saib. Champagne. Botachi, Mem Saib. If you will pardon my asking you, madam, but I, uh, I've never seen you before, somehow. <laughs> Oh, that's a question I always haven't answered. Yes, you probably have, Dr. Watson. You see, I was in the chorus at Daly's Theatre in London for a, <laughs> quite a few years until the Raja of Cavarotti decided I'd look better on his island than I did in front of the footlights. Uh, your husband, the Raja, is dead, isn't he? Yes, he, he was killed playing polo. Champagne, ma'am, say. Polo. Champagne, pin the Acha. He doesn't speak English, so I'll get along with telling him my troubles. Mr. Holmes... Somebody's trying to kill me. Kill you? It's good. Uh, may I ask what reason you have for saying that, madam? You may, Mr. Holmes. <clears throat> Before I left England, I had threatening letters warning me that if I ever went back to Cavarotti, I'd never get to the island alive. I got another letter in Port Side that said the same thing. You kept these letters, I trust? No, I didn't. I tore them up. I never did pay any attention to letters that weren't signed. Well, that's a great pity, madam. Those letters might have been invaluable. Well, it's too late to think about that now, Dr. Watson. Here's what's on my mind. I land at Cavarotti in the morning, and if anyone's up to a bit of no good, tonight's their last chance. You destroyed the threatening letters, madam, thereby indicating that you did not believe in the threats, and yet you now appear to feel that you are in danger. I wonder what made you change your mind. The Ace of Spades. Yes, I don't understand you, madam. In the last two days, every time I tell my fortune, I get the Ace of Spades. <laughs> now, you know what that means. Death. Oh, come now, madam. If you'll pardon my saying so, that's a very childish superstition. Well, the cards have never lied to me yet. Oh, you can laugh at it if you like, but I know. <laughs> well, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Anything you like, Mr. Holmes. Fire away. How long is it since you were in Cavarotti? Mm, about 18 months. We were in England when my husband died, and I couldn't face the idea of going back to that island alone. In three months ago, Verda... Oh, he's the chief minister of Cavarotti. Yes, 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 madam. We met him for a moment in the lounge. Oh, well. go. Verda came over to England to persuade me it was my duty as the Ronnie to go back. I see. As far as you know, have you any enemies among the passengers on board the ship? Oh, that's an odd one to answer, Mr. Holmes. But I can tell you right here in my suite there's someone who doesn't like me. A girl, Raduna, the one that brought you my message. She was in love with a Roger herself. I know she hates me, even though she did stay with me in England after my husband died. Mm, how about Ferda, your minister? <laughs> oh, he's all right. My husband thought the world of him, and he's been wonderful to me. He came from Cavarotti recently, you say, to persuade you to return there. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well, Bruma seems to be all right after drinking that champagne, so it'll be safe for us to have some now. Champagne on Lock Bidor? Both that, Jim, I'm side. Oh, I've been burning with curiosity to know why you gave him a glass of champagne a few minutes ago, and yet we... <laughs> didn't have any. Well, surely that's obvious, Watson. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fuma is the official poison taster, isn't he, madam? Mm-hmm. That's right, Mr. Holmes. 
He tastes everything I eat or drink before I do. If it doesn't affect him, then I know it's safe. Bertha brought him over to England when he came to fetch me. On the island of Cavarotti, poisoning's quite an arbor, you know. There were uh, two people in the smoking room tonight who seemed to know quite a lot about your island. The ship's doctor, a rather garrulous gentleman by the name of Harris, and Sir Christopher Wyatt, who owns tea plantations on the island. Do you know either of them, madam? I should say I do, both of them. Dr. Harris isn't any good. He was on the island for a bit, but got into some kind of trouble, and my husband had him thrown out. Mm, and how about Sir Christopher Wyatt? <laughs> oh, Chris is all right. I saw quite a bit of him in London after my husband's death. <laughs> As a matter of fact, well, if I weren't going back to Cavarotti, I, I don't think he'd be on the boat at all. He hasn't been there for over five years, ever since he had a row with my husband over the wages he paid the native labor. It seemed to me that several people aboard this boat have a personal interest in the island of Cavarotti. Interests that might uh, be influenced by your death. Yes, that's what I was going to say, madam. I think we should uh, keep an eye on you. Oh, that's just what I was hoping you'd say, Doctor. You see, I'm giving a bit of a supper party tonight. All the people we've been talking about have been invited. And I thought, well, I thought if you two were to be here, perhaps you'd be on the lookout for any any funny business. How about it? Well, of course we'll come, won't we, Holmes? I think it might be a good idea. Though I would suggest that we retain our incognitos as Mr. Hamish and uh, Mr. Michael. Whatever you say, Mr. Holmes. And now, let's have that champagne. You know, Holmes, I remember the rally when she was in the course of dailies. She looked stunning in tights. There was one night I... Yes, no, I'm all shattered. We... Don't mind. At what? the moment, there's a question I want to ask you. Oh, sir? Is your metal bag fully equipped with all the antidotes to poison? Poison? It's ridiculous. How could the Rani be poisoned when she has a poison taster? My dear Watson, you mustn't... Hey, hello! Help! Help! What the blazes is Come that? on, Watson. That cry came from the companionway. There are two figures struggling by the rail there. Good heavens! One of them has pushed the other down the companionway. Oh! Good Lord. His skull smashed in. I'm afraid what that he... It? What's happened? Sir Christopher Wyatt. What are you doing here? I was taking a stroll. I heard a yell from this direction and came here as fast as I could. Great Scott, this fellow's bleeding badly. We must get the ship's doctor. That's hardly necessary, I fear, Sir Christopher. What do you mean? In the first place, this man is dead. In the second place, he is the ship's doctor. <laughs> We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to ask you to do one thing for me. Well, I should say for yourself. Tomorrow night, if you're having meat or any meat dish for dinner, why not open up a bottle of Petri California Burgundy? That wonderful, rich, red Petri Burgundy will turn your dinner into a real feast. You see if it doesn't. Because there's nothing like a good wine with good food. And I know your family gets good food, and I know that Petri Burgundy is a good wine. In fact, it's a perfect mealtime wine. Try it and see. And now, Dr. Watson, tell us what happened next. You said you found the ship's doctor dead at the foot of the companionway? Yes, Mr. Bartell. His neck had been broken instantly. Imagine there was a good deal of excitement aboard. No, my boy. As a matter of fact, there wasn't. We managed to get the body back to its cabin without attracting attention. Holmes, after revealing his true identity, was able to persuade the captain to hush up the killing until after the Rani's party had taken place. Well, he didn't want to scare the murderer, I guess. What happened next, Doctor? Holmes and I returned to our cabin to dress for the party. Holmes, I remember, was in a state of suppressed excitement. He spoke quietly and deliberately. Watson, surely it's obvious why the doctor was murdered? Well, it isn't obvious to me. But it's elementary, my dear fellow. If you are playing a subtle murder by poison, how wise to remove the one man who might save the victim's life, a doctor. Oh, you keep harping on poisoning. It seems to me that it would be the last way a murderer would try to dispose of the Rani. Everything she touches is first tested by the poison tester. Exactly. That's why I call it a subtle murder attempt. Didn't you notice the physical attributes of Fruma, the poison tester? Uh, which in particular, huh? Well, his unusually glossy hair, his remarkably clear complexion, his plump figure. Look here. Just a one thing, will you? What's that? I presume that in your medical bag you have a supply of magnesia. Naturally. Do you also have hydrated ferric oxide? Yes, I do. Splendid. Then it's be off to party. Oh, funny things to take to a party, I must That's say. That's true, my dear fellow, but I'm afraid that this party may not prove as convivial as the Rani thinks. Nearly one in the morning. 
everything seems to be going splendidly. It seems to be, Watson, but keep your eyes on the Rani. Yes, I have been. The poison taste has tested everything that passed her lips. Uh, we do Doris to you, Sir Christopher. Uh, you having a good time? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Hamish. How about you, Mr. Mycroft? Oh, the Rani's a perfect hostess. Who could help having a good time? I don't think that girl, Regina, should be here, though. I don't want to be pompous, but after all, she's only a glorified servant. Oh, possibly the laws of etiquette are not so strict in ca uh, <coughs> Cavarati as they are in London, Sir Christopher. Oh, perhaps you're right. But I don't trust the girl. <coughs> Something's shifty about her. I've told the Rane more than once. Oh, well, I suppose it's none of my business. I think I'll try and persuade the Rane to sing us one of her old songs. Yeah. He doesn't trust Raduna, and I don't trust him. I don't think it was an accident that we found him near the body of Dr. Harris. Shh. Here comes Vera. I trust you gentlemen are enjoying yourself. Very much, Mr. Vera, thank you. I imagine you must be excited at the prospect of returning to Calavati. I am, Mr. Mycroft. Though I only left it three months ago, it has seemed more like three years. Do you can what time we'll arrive there? I am told that we shall be there in five hours, Mr. Hamish. Oh, look, look, look. The run is at the piano. She must be going to give us a tune. <laughs> yes, let's move a little closer, shall we? Chris here has asked me to sing something. Well, my voice isn't what it used to be, and don't I know it. But me spirit's the same, and that's enough to put a number over. So, old time boys, here we go. My sweetheart's the man in the moon. I'm going to marry him soon. Two would fill me with bliss just to give him one kiss. But I know that a dozen I never would miss. I'll go up in a great big... Oh... Great Scott, she, she... Quick, Watson, your medical bag. I'll lock the door. Right, go, Holmes. Bring some water, please. Help me. Oh, please, help what is the me. What is the matter? Don't be frightened, madam. I'll take care of you. Rest Give me water. She wants about three. Oh, such pain. All the symptoms of arsenic poisoning. Now I know why Holmes asked me if I had any magnesia. Ferric oxide. Do something for me, doctor. I'm dying. Don't worry, Your Highness. You're not going to die. She's going to live, Holmes. Ah, oh, gracious me, I'm tired. It's touch and go there for a while, though. Well done, Watson, old chap. Well done. Now that she's out of danger, why can't we all go back to our cabins? It's nearly dawn and we've been locked in here since one o'clock. You've no right to do this, you know. Possibly not, Sir Christopher, but there's a murderer in this cabin, and I don't intend to let him escape. Mr. Holmes, what happened? How could I have been poisoned when Fruma tasted everything first? Why wasn't he poisoned? For a very simple reason, Your Highness. The murderer has been conditioning Fruma for over a year. What, what do you mean? He's been feeding him gradually increasing doses of arsenic until he has finally become immune to the poison. Great Scott, I never thought of that. Fruma's glossy hair, his complexion, and stout figure are all typical of a person who consumes arsenic regularly. But who could have done it? Only one person had the opportunity. Well, tell us who that person no, is. No, not you, Sir Christopher, not you. For you haven't been on the island for years, whereas Fruma returned from Caravati but three months ago. Raduna has also been in London with her mistress for the past 18 months, remember? The answer is obvious. You did it, Verda. You brought the taster over when you came to fetch me. You'd prepared him for the year beforehand. Of course I did. No white Rana will ever rule over Cavaratti. And you murdered Dr. Harris. Equally true. Mr. Holmes, give me the key to the door, oh, please. Yeah. Oh, no. Huh? Do not come near me. Oh. Please throw it on the floor. Do not hesitate. You see this revolver? I should have no compunction in using it, I assure you. How do you expect to escape, Vera? The key, please. Thank you. You'll never get away with this, Verda, you devil. But I shall. We are now in the harbor of Cavarati. I shall swim ashore and arrange your welcome, my dear Rane. Turn your backs, please. Turn them. Thank you. Goodbye. He's gone. Come on, Watson. Talk to him. You, you have your revolver, Watson? Yes, but I didn't get a chance to draw it. He had me covered. I'll draw it now, old fellow. Aim for a leg or an arm and don't hesitate to shoot. There he is, up on the lifeboat. He's climbing up on the rail. Where is he? Where did he go? Out there on the rail above us, madam. 
He's going to dive. Give me that revolver, Dr. Watson. Quick, that's it. Come down off there, Verda. Wolves, Madeline, keep out of my face. There he goes. He's dived. Ah! Madam, you shot to kill. Of course I did, Mr. Holmes. Remember that we're now in Cavarotti waters. And that I, though I may not look like it at the moment, I am still the Ronnie of Cavarotti. <laughs> Say, that, that was a swell story, Doctor. It had a lot of color and quite a bit of action. <laughs> color and a bit of action? Well, <laughs> I, I'm glad you liked it, my boy. Oh, I did. Say, you know, that's not a bad idea. I mean, uh, having someone taste everything before you eat it. Oh, it's a very old idea, very old. Very common, too, years ago. You know the kind of job I'd like? No, what's, uh, what's that? I'd like to be the official taster for the Petri family. Boy, just think of all the Petri wine I'd get to taste. Petri to the right of me. Petri to the left of me. What a life. What wine. Yeah, I wouldn't mind having that job myself. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> the Petri family, you know, really knows how to make good wine. They've been making wine for generations. And because they've always owned and operated their own business ever since it was started way back in the 1800s, well, the Petri family has sure piled up plenty of skill and experience. Yes, they've been handing down in the family from father to son, from father to son... The fine art of turning luscious grapes into delicious wine. That's why you can't go wrong with any Petri wine. It must be good. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, uh, Doctor, what new story do you have lined up for us next well, week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had many years ago. It concerns a series of bonfires, an underground cellar full of gunpowder, and a strange death on the rooftops of London. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story The Adventure of the Mazarin Stone. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>